Hi, I'm Bill Nadera. Welcome to my channel dedicated to clinical endodontic education. Today's case, retreatment of tooth number 28. Let's get started. Tooth number 28 was diagnosed with previously root canal treatment and symptomatic apical periodontitis. The original root canal treatment was completed somewhere within the last year. The patient had symptoms that never fully resolved and recently the symptoms have been increasing. We see the prior root canal treatment uh, ending a little bit short of the radiographic apex. Could be considered clinically acceptable, but a little short for my liking. There's an associated periapical radiolucency. If we look closely, at the midroot area there on the distal, we see a vertical line. This vertical line that we're seeing should clue us into some sort of anatomical variations that are occurring here in the external root morphology because they're dual overlapping PDL spaces. You only get overlapping PDL spaces with broad roots with some either mesial or distal depression, multiple roots, some sort of kidney bean shaped anatomy. So we have to take this in consideration. Scans open and we're ready to do our endodontic overread. This is where we make our determination of the etiological variable. First thing I see when I look at this is the broad root system here in that buccal lingual direction, and I see the obturation material weighted to the buccal. Nature is symmetrical. There's clearly something happening on the lingual side of this root system. And if we look real close right here, we see the etiology. This is a lingual canal that is branching from the buccal canal, a type 4 bifidity, probably one of the most challenging root canal systems to treat, indicating some sort of portal of exit right in this area. This is going to help us plan our approach on how we're going to treat this canal. We'll come back to this view in a moment. Looking at the axial, working our way from the coronal down to the apex. Zooming in, we see the wide buccal lingual root and the narrow mesial distal distance of this premolar. And as we continue advancing, we see the root morphology change right about in this area, which is this mid-root area. We see this little notch. This little notch that we're seeing on the cone beam is a reflection of that vertical line we saw in the PA. The confirmation that we're dealing with some sort of external root morphology that's suggestive of multiple canals. We also see the gutta percha off-centered more toward the buccal, and there's no symmetry. The coronal view is going to really help us map out our approach because we can use this information to identify where that canal is going to be, and we use it by estimating our target vertical depth. Most cone beam software has measurement tools, and I'll find a, a reference point. I know there's sometimes some artifact that we have to work around, beam hardening, streaking, but it's minimal in this particular situation, so we can use that to our advantage. I'm going to use the buckle cusp tip as the reference point, and I'm going to measure from the buckle down to where that anatomical variation is, which is about 11 and a half millimeters. So I know that that split, that bifidity, is occurring 11 and a half millimeters from the buckle cusp tip. It's going to help us when we plan our strategy to try to treat this lingual canal. The intraoral exam shows no signs of swelling or infection. There's some slight palpation sensitivity on the gingiva apical to tooth number 28, and tooth number 28 is tender to percussion. The original root canal treatment appears to have been done through this restoration due to the composite that we're seeing there on the occlusal surface. The fact that we're dealing with an untreated lingual canal suggests that root canal retreatment is the best approach to move forward with this. I chose to use a split dam technique with rubber dam blockout material. The access for this case was performed through the original access just by removing the composite. Immediately after removing that restoration, you can visualize the obturation material. And we know that that's the obturation material in the buccal canal. We know that we need to move in the lingual direction. We know that the root morphology externally is very thin and narrow in the mesial distal direction. We know that we have a mesial root depression. We know that the lingual canal branches off the buccal canal at a very acute angle, approximately 11.5 millimeters from that buccal cusp tip. With all of this known information, we've got to plan a strategy on how we're going to find and treat that lingual canal. One strategy that I generally will witness from clinicians when they're learning how to treat deep bifidities is the troughing strategy. The troughing strategy involves extending the access here to the lingual, measuring that target vertical depth, 
and then using an ultrasonic instrument and advance that apically to the target vertical depth of about 11 and a half. This can be a very aggressive and unpredictable method in order to locate these deep lingual bifidities because it relies on the clinician to maintain precision orientation into very deep levels of that root canal system freehand. That's very difficult to do and it comes with high perforation risk. If there's no perforation, it comes with high misdirection risk and it comes with high ledge formation risk. Too many risks that I'm willing to take. There's a much better way to approach something like this, a much more conservative way to approach something like this, and that's by trying to treat this lingual canal through the buccal canal. We know where it branches, and we know it branches at an acute angle from that buccal canal about 11 and a half millimeters down. In order to try to approach this through the buccal canal, we first have to remove the gutta percha to that target vertical depth, 11 and a half, 12 millimeters or so. Once we remove that gutta percha from that root canal system, we then take small hand files, size 8s, size 10s. I like C files, they're a little stiffer. And you put little small bends in the first one, two, or three flutes of these files. Not millimeters, flutes. These are very, very tiny, small bends. And those little stoppers have those little notches. You want to line that notch up in the direction of the bend so you understand where that bend is when you place it in the canal. In this case, we're going for the lingual canal. So I'm going to want to try to come as far buckle as I can because I know that I'm trying to get in that canal at a very acute angle. By leaving the remainder of the gutta percha in that canal, it acts as an additional deflector to help my file find that additional anatomy. I'm not saying that this is easy. These are very difficult things to do. But if you understand what you're trying to do and set the stage for that outcome, then the odds of you achieving it are increased. The gutta perch has been removed. The file has been bent and measured to my target vertical depth, and it's placed. But look at this file approach. Look at the angulation. Look how far I'm coming in from the buckle. Not only am I coming in from the buckle, the file has a little bend on it. So I'll be able to get it into that acute branch from that buccal canal. Once I have that file in that canal, I try to open that canal orifice as much as I can with that file so that I can reproduce that the next time the file is placed in the canal. I use hand files to do my initial orifice enlargement when I'm dealing with bifidities because I want that ultimate tactile feel and I want that control. I'm not taking these larger hand files of 15s and 20s to length. I'm merely just using them to open up that orifice level. This is what the canal looks like when I've opened it up with a few hand files. Once those dentinal constrictions are removed a bit, then the need for pre-bending your hand files decreases and you can start applying them in there with no bends. All the obturation material from that buccal canal is then removed. We establish patency, working length, and again, go through our shaping protocols. Following full canal disinfection, you want to go ahead and dry that root canal system and then move forward with your obturation technique. My obturation technique for this case was single cone obturation with bioceramic sealer. I take pre-fit gutta percha cones and insert them through the sealer to length. I'll sear my gutta percha cones off at the level of the cable surface and then I'll take a cone fit image. I leave these cones seared off at the cable surface just so that I could retrieve them if for some reason I'm unhappy with my cone fit image. I was happy with what I saw in my cone fit image, so I went ahead and seared the cones off at the level of the orifice. I took a 5.7 plugger and condensed the material at that orifice level to create the seal that I needed. I placed the final restoration in this case. I etched the dentin, and since we're dealing with a ceramic full coverage restoration, I also etched the porcelain. And after the porcelain etched, I put a little silane on the area, air dried it, then I did my priming and bonding, and I placed the restoration. I try to place dual cure materials because it eliminates the variable of the light. This is the mesial shift image. We show two portals of exit there, which is consistent with what we saw in the cone beam scan. Not only was the lingual canal located and treated appropriately, we were able to get a little more length on that buccal canal. I took a post-op cone beam. I had to see what this anatomy looked like on the scan. Big difference of what we're seeing here. We're seeing symmetry. We're seeing exactly what we thought we would see. Portal of exit centered on that area of low density here. By taking the approach of strategic file bending and strategic file placement, we eliminated the damage to the lingual surface of the root, and we didn't create any ledges. So this was a very conservative approach. Looking at the axial and navigating from the coronal to the apex, confirming symmetry. Two canal systems treated in a symmetrical fashion, no damage in the mesial root depression, a very conservative treatment.
Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video presentation of mine today and stay tuned for the follow-up in six months. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I'm Bill Nudera. Thanks for watching.